This is TechSnap, episode 358. Welcome to TechSnap, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We recorded this episode on February 27th, 2018. It's brought to you by our three great sponsors, IX Systems, DigitalOcean, and Ting. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the presenter is Mr. Payne, Mr. West Payne. Hello, Chris. <laughs> Hello, Mr. West. It's good to be connected with you. You know, this is the last episode we're doing before I head off to scale next week. So long. I know, I know, I know. I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, so what do you say we warm up with a story that's brought to us courtesy of Mr. Troy Hunt, a security researcher who launched the Have I Been Pwned website many years ago, over 100 episodes ago, several, it may have been, I think, 243 of the TechSnap program. We talked about the Have I Been Pwned website. And this week... There's been some pretty big changes. Troy Hunt has something new, he's launched it, and it includes an API. Yeah, that's right. It's version two of Pwned Passwords, which is a subcomponent over at Have I Been Pwned that he first put into service last August. But now it's got an even better API and a whole bunch of new passwords. Now, if you haven't tried it, the idea behind Pwned Passwords is to help organizations and individuals avoid using passwords that have previously appeared in a data breach. So, This website maintains a whole huge list of passwords that have been obtained from data breaches. They they store all the, you know, they have access to the passwords and and the hashes of the passwords. And then he's built a tool where you can then input your password or, or check against a hash even, as we'll discuss, and then verify if that's in the database or not. Troy is like a dog with a bone when it comes to these password breaches. He goes through the data himself, and I follow him on Twitter, and a lot of times he'll tweet out and say, hey, this big data breach is getting all this attention. It's really just a remix of passwords that have been floating around on the web. So he does a super good job of sifting out what's actually new compromised data versus data that's been floating around for a while, but maybe somebody was just hoarding it. And all of that is reflected in this tool. But the missing piece has always been really making this available to end users, people with like password managers that just want to have better password hygiene. And with this API that Troy has built in, companies like Agile Bits are going to bake some of that functionality into their password manager 1Password, but they're doing it in a really clever way. Yeah, Troy got some help from some people at Cloudflare, and they found a brilliant way to check if a password is leaked without ever needing to send a password to their service. And that might be something, you know, if you're using you're using service Y over here and you're worried suddenly now that to check your password, they're sending your password all over the internet. Not so with this new technique. So how does it work? Okay, so imagine you're one password. First, you you hash the, the user's password using SHA-1, but you don't want to send the full hash to the server, right? So that would provide a little too much information. You could then at least do brute force attacks, if not something better. So instead, the new service only requires the first five characters of the hash. So oh. they just send a portion of the hash. To complete the process, the server sends back a list of leaked password hashes that start with those first five characters. And then in, on the client side, or on the on the one password side, they are then able to check against the full hash, against the list of full hashes sent from the server. All right, let me play this back to you and see if I'm tracking you, Wes. So one password, the application, sends five characters of a hashed password up to Troy's service. Then it retrieves what it thinks might be matching passwords, the full hash of them, and it does the rest of the comparison locally using the full hash that the local application is aware of. Exactly. Okay, that is actually a pretty good idea. Yeah, it adds some some very real security. And since password managers already make it really easy to generate a new password when you need to, it's just one more way that they can help you stay secure. I almost wonder if we could have this implemented at the operating system level. Now that would be handy. So you gave this thing a go. Did you put any uh, super complex passwords in there? You didn't do the one password approach, though. You actually went to the Have I Been Pwned site. Yeah, that's right. If you haven't tried it, it's a lot of fun. You can go, you know, the main page lets you put in a username or an email and see if that's appeared in data breaches. Uh, Up on the top menu, you'll see a password section. That's this pwned passwords tool. Uh, And there you can type in a a password, check it with the service. Now, they will caution you don't use a password you're, you know, you're actively using. Uh, it's, It's best in this case to check old passwords that way. But it's still a good thing to go check. And especially, you know, I'm sure many people have used some common passwords for insecure sites and felt bad about it meant to change them. This will definitely confirm. Go change those. Go put them in a password manager. (music) 
Our next story was definitely one of the most popular ones in our subreddit, techsnap.reddit.com, and it's a story about Apple moving Chinese customer data into China in local servers, and now it appears they're also moving some of the cryptographic keys that secure the data to Chinese servers. Yeah, that's right. Given iCloud's current architecture, pretty much everything that's stored there is encrypted, and the cryptographic keys are stored on Apple servers in the United States. Now, This has made some real pain points for Apple operating with local Chinese authority who obviously don't want to have to deal with the U.S. Even though the encrypted data may be stored within China without the keys, that's really just useless. Yeah, their complaint has been, well, we have to go through the U.S. legal system every time we want to get something out of iCloud for one of our Chinese users, which some people would argue that might be a good thing. Yeah, though it does seem like Apple tried their best to avoid having this happen, but were ultimately unsuccessful. And I can understand... China's a huge market. They obviously want to play there. I wonder if we're going to see a trend here. Essentially, if you want to run a major cloud data service in China, or maybe it's Iran or insert name of nation here, Canada, then you need to store the cryptographic keys for that data in that country. So that way you can comply with their local laws. I I could see I could see the argument for that for every nation. It seems like this is going to create a snowball effect. Yeah, I think as you know, as cloud cloud technology matures, Local governments are taking more of an interest in it, having more success legislating around it. So you will probably see that continue. Now, Apple does insist that this does not mean that the Chinese government has any sort of backdoor or increased access to this data. And by the time you listen to this episode, the data will have just been migrated. In fact, if you're listening to this on release day, it was migrated yesterday to Chinese servers. Sort of along these same lines, you may recall that Microsoft for years now has been in the courts battling a data request, I think, out of Ireland? Yeah, that's right. And the same day that Apple is migrating user data to Chinese servers, Microsoft is going to the Supreme Court to fight their data request battle. Now, they're not necessarily directly comparable situations, but the trend is clear. DigitalOcean.com or go to do.co slash snap to get everything I'm about to tell you. DigitalOcean is infrastructure on demand. If you are a beginner or an experienced administrator, you can deploy systems in seconds and they have a lot to choose from. Using their easy to use dashboard or their API, you can spend less time setting up systems and spin them up fast. And that's sort of the topic du jour this week and DigitalOcean's all about that. One click deployments of entire application stacks or just the base system. And recently, DigitalOcean has made their plans even more competitive, and they've introduced flexible droplets where you can mix and match your resources, as well as CPU-optimized droplets. And for a limited time, DigitalOcean is offering TechSnap listeners $100 in service credit. If you're a new customer, you go to do.co slash snap or use our promo code after you've created an account. It's SnapOcean. One word, you apply that to your account, $100 $100 in DigitalOcean credit to try out their incredibly fast infrastructure. Everything with SSDs, eight data centers all over the world. You'll be amazed. DigitalOcean.com, promo code SNAPOcean, or do.co slash snap. There's no shame in firing up a private web browser session from time to time, whether it's to visit a naughty site or just to protect your personal information. But you've probably often wondered, how private are these private browsing sessions, and could they be better? Well, a new research project says yes, they could be a lot better. Yeah, that's right. Veil, a new deployment framework out of the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, aims to prevent a whole bunch of information leaks that currently happen through the browser's private modes, things like the file system, browser cache, or DNS. Many of the current techniques sort of rely on functionality where you have a you have a private session, you can go browse, it keeps some relative history within there, and once you've closed your session, everything's deleted. There's a lot of problems with that. And one is what happens when the browser crashes. In many cases, that can leave a whole bunch of so-called private information exposed on disk. Yeah, I think another issue is what happens if your system runs low on memory and you have to start swapping to disk. Some of that might be in your page file or in your swap partition. But I think there's a bigger problem here. It's the ISP. It's your DNS. Yeah, there's all there's any number of third-party factors that can still track you, acquire information on you. Veil aims to solve this in kind of a new way. Veil leverages the fact that even though developers do not control the client-side browser implementation, they do control what is sent to those browsers and, in many cases, the servers that deliver that content. So in this new framework, 
Veil websites collectively store their content on Veil's blinding servers instead of on individual site-specific servers. To publish a new page, developers pass their HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files to Veil's compiler, which they've made available. The compiler transforms the URLs in that content so that when the page loads on a user's browser, the URLs that are actually used are derived from a secret user key. The blinding service and the Veil page exchange encrypted data that is also protected by the user's key. The result is that Veil pages can safely store encrypted content in the browser cache. Furthermore, the URLs exposed to system interfaces like the DNS cache are unintelligible to attackers who do not possess the user's key. Right. So maybe at best, the ISP is going to see a connection to this blinding server, but they won't see all the individual DNS requests or even necessarily the contents of the data. Exactly. Now, there are some downsides here, right, or at least complications. This does require using their special compiler and hosting everything through their service. So users no longer type a URL, in, URL into a browser. Instead, they go to the Veil website, enter the URL there, and then they can actually visit the page. Could be you're taking the point of failure from evidence left on the disk or in the swap file or in DNS queries and moving it now to a central server. Yeah, that does bring up the issue is that you do have to trust the blinding servers here. Now, obviously, the people behind this have some, some good intentions. That's often not good enough. They are working on a method where you'll be able to run a self-hosted Veil server. Another problem with this model is that currently it's opt-in, right? So you have to elect to use the Veil system, go do the compilation steps, upload it to the blinding server network before it can be used at all, and users need to know how to access it. I can't imagine a world where if this became popular, there'd be browser, you know, browser plugins at least, if not built-in functionality, but we're a long way from there. If the web can do it with AMP, then I suppose it's technically possible they could do it with Veil. And the fact that you can self-host, that sort of alleviates some of my concerns. And it is encrypted to the user's key, so even if you got to the blinding server, the data on there is still encrypted. Those those are all pretty good safety checks. Yeah, I like, I like that spin. It's AMP, but security over speed. With all of the vulnerabilities we talk about on this show, you'd think that they're all getting tracked. We've got an eye on all of it. But it turns out that a massive number of vulnerabilities identified last year never even received a CVE identifier. Yeah, that's right. According to a new RBS report, out of the 20,832 vulnerabilities that were discovered in 2017, only about 12,000 of those actually received a CVE, CVE identifier. So we're talking 7,900 bugs that just never even got an identifier. Exactly. Now, there are any number of reasons for this, but one of them is the explosion of security bugs in IoT devices, which has made it much harder for MITRE and NVD staff to keep up with all the bugs. Furthermore, almost 7 million vulnerabilities received a reserved CVE status with no public details available, despite over a thousand of them having a public disclosure. Over a thousand publicly disclosed but never received a CVE, it's starting to sound like they just can't keep up with the avalanche of security issues. Yeah, and it kind of makes sense. There was a 31% increase in total vulnerabilities between 2017 and 2016. Of those, about 44% went through coordinated disclosure with the vendor. So not great, but at least better than we, yeah. than we might hope for. Yeah. And 12 companies accounted for 54% of all security bugs, oh, which, boy. wow. Yeah, that is, I bet you Google is <laughs> one of those. <laughs> Just about half of those vulnerabilities can be exploited remotely. And so those are obviously the some of the scariest ones. And then a quarter have not received a patch. Really? That's one thing that's really struck me this year is I've been doing more more. CVE related work and just looking through there, even on, you know, well supported operating systems, there's any number of even even the ones that make it to be documented and get a CVE status. Many of them, maybe they just don't have a release that's available. Maybe it's a PR exists somewhere or you just don't know. Yeah, I guess that does sort of bear out with what I've seen. And then you figure, too, you've got all these cryptocurrencies that are cropping up, all of these different implementations that have lots of flaws. Yeah, that's right. And those flaws have real consequences. 2017, also record-breaking in the number of security incidents with over 5,000 data breaches that exposed over 7 billion user records. Woo! All right, and then let's, let's wrap up with a quick quiz for you, Chris. What do you think was the top product, the one with the most vulnerabilities without a CVE identifier? 
Oh, oh, without. Oh, shoot. I don't know. That's tough. Uh, see, I was going to say something Google related just because they've, they've got millions of eyes. They have a pretty established, uh, they've got millions of eyes. They have a pretty established bounty program and they're pretty on top of security issues. So by just being on top of security issues and being willing to fix them, you tend to generate a lot of CVEs. So I was going to say Google, but you're saying without anything assigned, uh, Linux, something in the open source community. You're close. Chrome OS. Oh, but there you go. Both. <laughs> Chrome OS, huh? ixsystems.com slash techsnap. Go there to learn more about IX Systems, support the show, and grab their free white paper, The Ultimate Guide to Buying a New Server for Open Source. Thousands of companies, universities, and government organizations are IX Systems customers. They're headquartered in Silicon Valley since 1996, and they have dedication to white glove customer service. Industry-leading support. I was just on our sysadmin today, and there's an entire thread in there glowing reviews of iX Systems customer support. They have transparent technological decisions and contributions that they make upstream to projects like FreeBSD. They've been a member of the FreeBSD community for years. Of course, they're also backers of FreeNAS and TrueNAS. They're a great company with an even better product. iXSystems.com slash TechSnap. That's where you go to learn more and begin the process. Once you engage with their sales personnel, I believe you'll immediately recognize the difference if you've been in this industry for even more than just a couple of years. iXSystems.com slash TechSnap. A new mysterious threat appears to be emerging from the distance. First they came for your virtual machines. And now, they're coming for your containers. It's serverless architecture. What is it? What are its drawbacks? And what is it good at? It's a TechSnap introduction to serverless architecture. Now, like any trendy tech term, serverless means different things to different people. But what we're talking about is kind of made up of two pieces. A function as a service platform, allowing deployments of functions which the platform will provision on demand and scale as needed, and then an event-based execution model that's actually used to trigger those functions. You're probably familiar with some of these, like AWS Lambda or Apache OpenWhisk. Now, we were just talking about function as a service, but what does that mean? Here, we're talking about the, the nature of a function, meaning that it takes some data in and some data out, and that really relates to the serverless definition. I mean, what does it really mean to be serverless, Chris? Surely that's nonsense. These things are running on servers somewhere, right? Just somebody else's. But they're running in ephemeral containers, and that's key. When you deploy to serverless environments, you have to assume that you don't have any local state, no mechanisms to keep things, and that every time you run, you may be on totally new hardware, a totally new operating system. But if you can work within these constraints, there are some big promises, like no server management. So what does no server management actually look like? Because obviously the vendor is going to be doing some sort of server management. So from your perspective, deploying the software, what does that actually mean? Yeah, so it means you focus on the code. Uh, so I don't, I don't worry about the server hardware. I don't worry about the OS, the patches. Yeah, and when you look at... Not only that, but you also, in many cases, now you can also run Docker containers in a, in a lot of these and, and have them set up to act as, as a function. But in particular, let's take AWS Lambda. They have a list of languages they support, things like Go, Node, or anything that runs on the JVM. They manage those environments for you. So you just say, you've written a cool new Go app. You're going gonna to put it up. It has all the latest neat J Jupyter Broadcasting things. You just ship a, a bundled up zip file of Go code to Amazon, they handle everything else. You configure what it responds to, how incoming data gets there, what it's allowed to access, they do the rest. Right, and this could be really useful. Say like we had a special uh, Linux Unplugged where there was a cage fight between Greg K.H. and Linus Torvalds and Richard Stallman. That's coming right up, right? Yeah, and we released that and it just goes huge. It gets, you know, a million downloads. The nice thing about a serverless infrastructure like this is you could set thresholds so when memory and CPU usage get to a certain point, it just spins up more instances and the application designers don't really have to change much. Right. I think that that is one thing. There are obviously design constraints, considerations, but many of them are trends that server applications are trending towards anyway. Having external state stores, and when you design with these in mind, many best practices are taken care of for you. 
An example of this is high availability. It's pretty easy to design a program that runs on one server, but when you go with the serverless architecture, you immediately have to think about, you know, design this in a way that can scale, that makes it really easy to have a high availability system. I would imagine it also means you're not just sitting around with idle systems. Uh, even in, a, in the scenario of VPS with containers, I have my VPSs sitting up there often at very low resource utilization, but they're still costing me money. Yeah, that's right. Um, many of these cloud providers have mechanisms in place that control how your functions are invoked. And so when you have no when you have no one making HTTP requests for, to you, for instance, you don't need to invoke any functions. And since you only pay for the resources and the time that you use, that can be that can be real cost savings, especially if you have widely variable traffic. This really does, though, smell like the ultimate layer of abstraction to me. Like you're now, we had virtualization, then we had containers, and now we have serverless. And the developer never has to get anywhere near the operating system for this. Yeah, in many cases that can, you know, that can simplify things if you don't have to care about that, especially if maybe that's not where your value add is. You are just working with a bunch of other cloud-based services, data stores, databases. You know, that might make a lot of sense. In some cases it can be of course more difficult debugging um, the de- development workflow. Those are all things that are being worked on. It's a little harder to SSH into ephemeral container that may or may not exist by the time you need to check it. So you really have to make sure things like logging and your observability tools are in there for you. Again, these are usually things you want anyway, but a lot of your old tricks aren't going to work in this environment. So no local disk, essentially no local state. That sounds like one of the big constraints of serverless is you you can't just have the program execute something and hold on to it for you until the application needs it. Yeah, you're also usually constrained on the environment you run in. So you have a limited amount of memory. Oftentimes you pay based on how much memory you're going to need and you're time limited. So you can't write a function that will run forever. You get a certain execution window. I mean, I could think about right off the top of my head, a couple of different use cases in the past, you know, business side applications that are running 24-7, call management software, database software. In the case of Jupyter Broadcasting, our live stream goes 24-7. These all seem like they wouldn't be the right workload for a serverless architecture. Am I right? Yeah, there, there are definitely some, you know, persistent system, systems that have, you know, 24-7 engagement or are just continuously actually doing something where maybe this isn't the best style. Um, there, there are some tools if you're using container workflows to have, have more permanence, but serverless has not been optimized for that. Now, if you have a lot of back-end processing jobs, you can think of encoding pipelines, anything else like that. That's where it really shines. So I think that is a key takeaway. Don't just go serverless all the things. If you're going to use it, use it where it makes sense and where you can actually get benefits from it. We've got an email into the show before, too, where I know, like, this is all kind of early days is what I took away from it. The email went something like AWS Lambda has, like, a total number of of concurrent executions that you can run on any of your AWS account instances, which means that if you have dev going on at the same time you have production going on, you could have somebody try something out on the dev environment, maybe execute a thousand concurrent Lambda functions, and you essentially DDoS your production applications. These aren't insurmountable problems. You could break up multiple accounts, but it does really smell like early days. I think it also underscores the point that you may not be doing, you know, Linux system OS administration, but you do have to administer all the different widgets, tooling, permissions, and roles that take place in an AWS or similar cloud environment. So the complexity has changed, but it hasn't necessarily gone away. Having spent many late nights working with developers to patch systems, this does come to mind right here. I think... Boy, this part's got to be better because Amazon, for example, is managing all of the servers. They're patching against Meltdown and Spectre, and the developers are just completely unaware. The two things are totally divorced. Yeah, that is a huge benefit, right? When you when you do have these these platforms as a service, you don't have to think about that. You can just assume that once a patch is available and a patch system is available, your next function invocation will take place on a patch system. You don't have to think at all about OS level patches and that's a lot of state you don't have to manage. You don't have to have a checklist of all the servers to check if they've patched. You don't have to set up automatic scans of those servers to make sure that they they applied the patch. And you don't have to actually go do the patching yourself. At the same time, it could be shifting some of the security honest to the application because if the operating system essentially becomes unreachable by attackers, they're just going to focus on the application. Yeah, that's right. When the OS becomes less of an attack service, the application is a natural target. And 
as we all know, there's a whole bunch of third-party dependencies, especially when you're operating in a serverless or cloud environment. You're going to be talking to different cloud APIs. You're going to be pulling in their development kits and other tools. Plus, you're just doing a lot of HTTP or other networked communication. And so while you may not need to actively scan all of your servers for vulnerabilities and deal with the active state of those systems, you do have to start thinking about, and should be already, do I have patches? Am I checking the, the versions of software that I ship? Are, are there vulnerabilities in those libraries? How do I check for those? How do I mitigate them? What is our deployment strategy to take care of that? Another potential advantage of serverless is the short-lived natures of the servers. Because you're in a time-limited execution window, and then you know many invocations don't even last that long, machines can constantly be created and destroyed. So even if one is compromised on the OS level, they won't have a long time to try to leverage that to gain access to other systems. Somewhat in the neutral category, a serverless architecture can help you resist some classes of denial of service attack. Mostly, if, if malicious traffic is directed at you in a traditional setup, that could often limit the amount of access regular users would have. But in a serverless environment, as long as your cloud provider can scale, you scale. Now, of course, the downside here is you still end up paying for those resources. Now, it's not all a win for security with serverless. The complexity doesn't go away. And in some respects, Serverless is kind of an extreme version of microservices, and you have to deal with all the granular permissions between those services. It can be really easy and really tempting to make way too broad of groups to make it really easy. Oh, if everything can talk to everything, it just works. But that is not a secure setup. That's a great way to actually, you know, even if you then can get access, suddenly you have access to everything else. But managing, you know, hundreds, all the... the right, you don't want to go too far the other way either. Right. And you need to develop tools and procedures to help you keep those secure, manage them, and set that up in an automated way as well. So in many respects, it, it is still a difficult proposition. You just have new tools to deal with. Well, that's sort of my concern when I'm listening to this, is the administration role sort of moves from managing the operating system, getting it installed, configuring it, its patches, making adjustments based on uh, feedback. And instead, now it's sort of managing these abstraction layers that AWS gives you, managing your permissions on AWS, your wrangling um, accounts, and uh, managing that kind of relationship. That's sort of the admin job now, in, in taken to the extreme. If, if everybody goes all in on this, there's not a lot of servers that they're going to be managing directly. It'll be more like interfacing with companies. Of course, these companies are running servers, but you know what I mean? Like the whole role could be shifting. Right, very much. Instead of your operations engineer, you know, building out new servers for you, they're setting up the AWS VPC and ensuring the security roles are all correct. The, the role doesn't go away, it just changes. Now, there is a way to have your cake and eat it too. There's some open source function as a service solutions uh, from a few names we know. Yeah, like open function as a service. Now, this one's fun because it mixes your Docker and your Kubernetes. So that's what I'm saying. Your cake and you get to eat it too with open function as a service, which uh, we'll have linked in the show notes if you go to techsnap.systems slash 358. Or if you're more a fan of the Apache Foundation, check out Apache OpenWhisk, which is currently incubating but is a serverless open source cloud platform that executes functions in response to events at any scale. And there's a plethora of other open source function as a service projects that you should definitely go check out. There are even some handy libraries coming out to abstract beyond that level. You can go check out serverless.com, which is a toolkit for deploying and operating serverless architectures. They've got support for Amazon, Google Cloud, Azure, and OpenWhisk. But out of those, OpenFast has really caught my eye. I think I'll be trying it out here before long, mostly because it's a, it's a framework that builds a, on top of Docker and Kubernetes. And it's got first-class support for metrics. So if you're already interested in Kubernetes, you're already playing with things like Prometheus, OpenFast fits right into that platform, and you can build atop the systems you're already developing. The other thing that's pretty great is just a few days ago, as of this recording, Alex Ills, the project creator of OpenFast, announced that he's going full-time to work on the project. If you've got experience working with serverless architecture, or maybe you've tried out OpenFast or one of the others, let us know your experience. TechSnap.Systems slash contact. TechSnap.Ting.com. Ting is mobile that makes sense. You pay for what you use. It's simply a smarter way to do mobile. And if the market had to hit the reset button today, this is how everyone would do it. It's nationwide coverage with no contracts, no early termination fees, no quote unquote agreements. It's just a fair price for however much you talk, text, and data you use. And you're in control all of the time. They have a great dashboard so you can see your usage at a glance. You can take complete control and set usage alerts. Now you can bring your own 
own device or grab one from Ting directly. They have a CDMA and a GSM network, which means there's lots of devices they support, and it's really handy if you're traveling about or different types of networks work better in your area. TechSnap.Ting.com will take $25 off a device or... If you bring that device, $25 in service credit. After you visit techsnap.ting.com, head over to their blog and check out their workflow that they've blogged about with using If This Then That to automatically connect to the right Wi-Fi network. This is kind of a cool handy guide and a really powerful tool under Android. It can use your location or not, and it can really up your game and save you money. I'll be using Ting on my entire trip down to scale, and I'm very, very thankful they have those two networks, techsnap.ting.com. Thanks for visiting techsnap.system slash contact to send your feedback, follow up and questions into the show. And uh, David writes in with some drive tips. He says, if I'm guessing correctly, you're about to dance with the hard drives very soon. He's referring to our free NAS migration. <laughs> That's good. And he's spot on. Yeah, we'll probably, I would imagine, tackle that pretty soon after I get back from scale. Um, just sort of uh, got this email and I thought, geez, David here has some great tips. He says, do a smart test before doing anything with smart CTL. Check out each drive. Program smart tests directly on the FreeNAS to do that for you. Label your drives with love and care. Do a quick benchmark of your drives and your network, which I think that's a great idea, not only to get an idea of their speed, but just to get a sense of their health, too. That's another reason I like that one, David. He says, also consider updating the firmware of your LSI card if you have one. He'll send along further details to that. Those are some good tips. If you have tips on things we should do before we move, I think it's four disks that have probably been in production 24-7 for at least three years in sort of hostile temperature conditions because it's out in the studio garage, a.k.a. our data center. So if you have tips for things that we should try or test before we move those drives and keep them in production, send them in, techsnap.systems slash contact. Also, David mentions that in FreeNAS 11.1 and up, it's really easy to go activate the net data service, which, if you haven't tried it, is a super handy tool can integrate with a bunch of those with smart CTL and, and other tooling and just makes beautiful graphs. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we have talked about that a little bit in the past. I, I love that. Thank you, David. That's a great email. Alex writes in with some really big cloud storage requirements. He says, I have a new business client who has a very large amount of data. I don't think he has a full assessment yet, but he says it could be as much as 100 terabytes of video, photos, and documents. Right now, those files are scattered among multiple computers and external hard drives. Their ultimate goal is to eventually consolidate all of those files into one location that will be accessible online by five different employees. My initial instinct was to have them purchase an unlimited business plan on Dropbox or Box and upload the files there. But on closer examination, I've noticed that these so-called unlimited plans really aren't. Apparently, Dropbox caps you at two terabytes, and then you have to contact them and beg to increase your storage capacity. And I'm guessing Box has a similar situation. My other thought is to create a VPS on DigitalOcean, Amazon, or Google's cloud. But paying monthly for storing up to 100 terabytes of files would almost certainly become cost prohibitive. Doing a quick calculation on DigitalOcean's space options, I see I could store 10 terabytes for about $200 a month, which would be fine if 10 terabytes of storage is all the business needed. But if they really do have 100 terabytes then the monthly cost goes up to $2,000 a month. I know that AWS offers Glacier Storage for only four-tenths of a cent, so that might be a good option, but I was hoping to avoid AWS because their interface has 5,000 features that seem really confusing. How would you approach this situation, and what would you guys do for more affordable online storage? Thanks in advance, Alex. That's a hard question. I'm glad I don't have 100 terabytes to store right now. Really, I think it depends on a, you know, a huge number of factors here. In particular, what kind of interface do the people actually using the data need? Is API level access sufficient? Does there need to be an easy to use user interface? That may be a serious restriction on a lot of these services. If cloud level storage is okay, you might check out Backblaze's B2 storage service. They do seem to be a little cheaper than their competitors. Uh, it seems like they started around five tenths of a cent per gigabyte. So with 100 TB, that's probably around $500 a month. I don't know if that makes sense. And that's only 
the storage of cost, you will also have to pay to download the files. Yeah, they might get you on that transfer. That's a great point. Alex, this is literally the situation that Jupiter Broadcasting has found ourselves in. And that's why after looking at this over and over and over again, I opted to double down on our free NAS setup and then work on giving remote access or syncing the essential files to local file systems, which is sort of a hybrid approach I'm taking, where the free NAS will have the ultimate large storage. But the current working projects, which tend to be a subset of the data requirements, those can be synced to individual systems, which is a nice approach. You could look into just changing this a bit because you're never going to beat loading up a bunch of disks on a local server and then coming up with remote access solution or even just sticking that in a rack somewhere. This is getting to the point with 100 terabytes where you could probably call somebody up on the phone and ask for a custom solution and a custom quote. So also consider that route, but I'm not even sure where you would go for that. And that really depends on your ability, you know, does the, can the client administer this thing, keep it up to date, do backups and, and maintain that? Or are they okay with paying more and offloading all of those? Yeah, yep, absolutely. A good one. And Alex, let us know which direction you go. And if you have any notes on the type of interface they need, if it needs to be on the file system, if it needs to be through a website, if it's something that could use an API and retrieve files, that changes all of your options. If you want to follow up with any of that stuff, let us know. techsnap.system slash contact. And thank you for the question. Well, that brings us to the end of today's broadcast. You can find links to everything we talked about over at techsnap.systems slash 358. You know, I'll give a mention, too. I'm going to be in Pasadena, California next week at Scale 16X, which may affect our recording schedule for the TechSnap program. So heads up to that Scale 16X Pasadena, California next week if you're in the area and want to come say hi. Also, a gratuitous, shameless plug for Tech Talk today. It is relaunched. We've done two episodes really, really happy with how they've turned out. I'll be chronicling some of the journey to scale in that show as well. TechTalk.today is where you go to get that. And I think you're really going to enjoy it. I know I sure did. You can subscribe to our humble podcast over at techsnap.systems slash subscribe. He's at Wes Payne. I'm at Chris LAS. Thank you so much for joining us. See you next week. Next week.